Okay, good. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, hello and welcome to this webinar this morning on towards an ISO technical report on the use of biometrics for identity management in healthcare. The recording and presentations will be available on the Panachair website, www.panachairresearch.eu after this um, event. My name is Stephanie Park and I'm Senior Researcher at Trust IT, where one of my roles is helping organisations contribute to standardisation. Um, this interactive workshop will present not only the ISO technical report, but a set of new use cases that will be selected by you, the participants, for an in-depth discussion later on. Please use the Q&A panel to post your questions and comments on today's presentations because this will be automatically recorded. If it goes into the chat, we may lose them. So thank you for that. Uh, later on, we'll be opening the floor to participants. But now my colleague, Rita Jufrida, research analyst at Trust IT, will launch, will launch our first poll. Please answer the questions based on your direct experience says, or um, your knowledge of the healthcare environment. Okay, thank you. We can go with the first poll, Rita. Thank you very much. If not, I can launch it. Rita, are you there? Uh, yes, I am here, and um, I have already shared the poll, and I see that some people are already okay. replying to it. Uh, so right now we have almost everyone uh, that has uh, replied. Okay, and... super. Okay. So this is all really a basic question, just asking you how familiar you are, you are already with the use of biometrics in healthcare. So as soon as we get... Um, a high percentage of responses, Rita, you can share the results, please, and then we'll move on to our first presentation. So just give us the, give us a nod when, when it's done, Rita, okay, because I can't actually see the poll for some reason. Okay, no problem. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm ending the, um, let's see, uh, the, the, the poll one right now. And uh, we have actually uh, the majority of people, uh, more than 50%, that is not familiar at all with the use of biometrics in healthcare. Uh, then we have almost 30% of the participants that are quite familiar, and only a 9% of people that are very familiar. Okay, so let's hope that this workshop then will. Oh, now I see. So thank you, everyone, for voting this morning. I think we can stop sharing the results now, Rita. So let's hope the workshop then will um, be very informative and show you lots of use cases and benefits also um, of using biometrics in healthcare for identity management. Um, it's now my pleasure to pass the floor to Dr. Manuel Spanakis, who is collaborating research at the Foundation for Research and Technology, um, HELUS, so the abbreviated is for. Um, his expertise lies in medicine and wireless communication networks, spanning by medical informatics, wireless medical centers, e-health and um, health related services. So thank you. Um, the floor is yours. And let me just stop thank share, let, um, share results. Okay. And that we can then close the poll. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Allow me to say a few words. Just what is the scope of this uh, specific uh, workshop? I will try to emphasize why do we need biometrics uh, for healthcare? So in the general uh, speaking domain of healthcare, we know that it is a vast environment. We have many applications, many devices, many people, many experts. And the ambition is to create such an ecosystem trying to empower everyone to improve the way we do things, but also to change in the future our strategies, the way we provide diagnostic tools, treatments, how we make our uh, healthcare management system and our healthcare system resilient. For example, what happened now in the case of a pandemic worldwide. And in this, in this domain, we know that security in its uh, general essence is very critical. So the idea is that uh, we faced during the last 
months have changed in the traditional way we see uh, healthcare and how we use our assets to provide uh, healthcare services uh, to patients. So we move from the traditional example that you see on the right to the what we call smart hospital that has many different uh, assets and resources to be shared and to be used among people. So in that sense, all these sources or these assets face security risks. And we know that in uh, healthcare related infrastructure, the risks can be accounted, can be measured and uh, can be cl classified and quantified. And in, uh, in general, uh, as we see here from, from a study uh, from ANISA, uh, security release, uh, resilience is a big uh, issue in uh, the healthcare sector. So healthcare is a rich source of valuable data uh, system and it's attractive to cyber uh, threats uh, its main weaknesses are being based uh, due to the dynamic complexity of the environment. So it's a continuously changing environment. It has barriers that do not allow a fast adoption of uh, any security solution. And this, is, this makes sense because if you had an IT company and you would enforce security measures to be taken to, uh, throughout your company, uh, your, the organization of your company, this could, might be easy, but in a healthcare organization, the main, the main goal of this organization is to provide uh, care services to people, which means that in order to integrate any outside uh, security solution or different workflow, this means that we need to change the way we think, the way we perform, we need to find budget for it, et cetera, et cetera. More than that, uh, in a healthcare organization, humans are the most important resource we have. And we need to minimize human errors. We need to allow the staff to do unobstructively their main tasks. And at the same time, we need to ensure that all their tasks are being handled using ICT, ICT systems that employ security. So in Panacea, we have different uh, areas when, where we want to, to improve uh, the state-of-the-art solution. We want to increase patient trust and safety. Most of all, we want to lessen the risk of having a security breach. We want to improve care services uh, in our data infrastructure. And of course, uh, the reason we have in this workshop, we, know we want to support standardization. This is very important because standardization would allow us to Interesting the weaknesses in terms of IT and identity management systems and focus on how we can use beyond state-of-the-art systems for identity management in healthcare. These are the systems that we mainly use today to access our bank accounts or our phones, but they must be generalized on healthcare. So there are many advantages because this would enable people to be identified much more quickly, much more resilient, much more securely, and it would allow them to access sensitive services very quickly, simplify the way they log in into a service. They don't need now to remember something. They just want to be there. And privacy and protection of personal data within a hospital is becoming today a very important issue. So our effort and our goal in Panacea uh, is to create a frictionless GDPR compliant tool based on two authentication factors, what we are and what we have. And this is biometrics, biometry, and maybe a smartphone or something that we own. We want to develop a human to machine authentication tool in order to increase security by resolving any credential sharing issues. Today, we see examples for many, from many, many people and many, many interviews we had that credentials are not securely handled within hospitals. So in order to do that, we wanted to create, uh, we wanted to provide input to an ISO, to a respected ISO, and you will hear more about the ISO later on. And we wanted this workshop in order to define a set of, a set of use cases related to healthcare. And this would allow us to create a set of requirements for biometrics and healthcare in terms of logical authentication, remote access, and putting people, heterogeneous people together to materialize uh, current attention they give in all these issues. And with this, I would like to welcome you in this workshop. This is uh, this workshop targets 
uh, many uh, different people from IT, from healthcare, uh, from biomedical informatics, and all the stakeholders need to participate in order to understand the advantages of biometry and uh, identity management and how this can be utilized in healthcare to learn about different use cases and how this could be integrated into, into an ISO technical report. And we invite you and people that you know that would like to provide input to that. And we thank you in advance and to present different viewpoints on current and potential use cases in that respect. And with these slides, I would like to, to thank you and tell you that this is a very interesting topic. Biometrics in healthcare are coming and they're coming very fast and we will see how they will influence the way we service people in the future. Stephanie, yeah. the floor is back to you. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, super important. I think all the points that you've raised here this morning, um, we need to innovate in the healthcare sector and make sure that all of those precious human resources are as safe as possible as the patients themselves. Okay, well now we'll move on to our round table debate where you, uh, Manolis, will be joined by um, uh, Klaus Buzou and uh, Pierre Gasson, from, both from IDEMIA and very much involved in the ISO technical report as yourself. Um, Manolis, um, I'd like to ask each of you um, to summarize the key drivers for the use of biometrics based on your research and the ongoing work on standardization. If we can start with you, Claude, and then I'll pass the floor to Manolis and then Pierre, okay? And just a reminder to the audience that if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A panel, okay? Claude, I'll let you go first. So what are the main drivers? Um, Manolis has already given us a few clues as, on the drivers for biometrics, but we, we'd li I'd like to use this round table discussion to go into a bit more detail before we look at the ISO technical report. Okay. So what for you are the main drivers uh, for, the, for using biometrics in healthcare? Okay, what, so what, I'm- yeah, Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, know, I don't know whether I should turn my video on. I think that's the rules. <laughs> okay. That's uh, perfect. Uh, so the identity management is something that can be done uh, from other things than biometrics. However, as Manolis already explained, when you do it with biometrics, first, you don't need to learn something. You don't need to have a password that you need to remember and change every month with a capital character and uh, normal characters and special characters and numbers, etc., etc., which is basically um, not feasible. And you just have to carry something that could be stolen. So the benefit of biometrics for an, any industry is clearly that you carry it with it. However, there is also some kind of drawback to biometrics. It's not 100% reliable. So you have, I, I think um, you have seen those curves already where you see that biometrics have some false error, false alerts. So someone uh, is um, taken for another person and false reject, so you are not recognized, right? So the goal of biometrics, and I've been working for in this, in this domain for many years, uh, is to minimize the errors in both directions, right? Uh, the, the benefit for healthcare, we have seen that in the Panacea project, because basically in the Panacea project, at least for Pierre and I, uh, it was something that was quite new, uh, is that in, in the health domain, at least for the doctor's side, um, they don't have time. They don't have time to remember pass passwords. And also they share they share hardware, okay? So the same radiology equipment will be shared by the different people. So they cannot be prompted for their own password because we don't know who is going to connect, whether it's Dr. X or Dr. Y. So it's very convenient in the field of healthcare because it makes it possible to share resources easily. 
we will see with the use case that it's not only useful for doctors and medical personnel, but it's also something that could be helpful for patients. And that's it for me. Okay, uh, I totally, yeah. I totally agree with Claude. Just to give you some more input, um, together with Idemia, Fourth is uh, trying to study biometrics and the ways that they can be integrated to healthcare for the past uh, five or six years. Uh, and uh, our experience says that in many ways, we see uh, a transversion from a paper-like ID management system, from uh, ID management system that have been based to simple technologies that they can include some data to us, to, uh, to ID management systems that would allow someone to access any system, anytime, anywhere. And uh, this means private systems and public systems. So we are inside the hospital and imagine what a doctor has to do and what a patient has to do. A doctor has to be able to access, either physically access uh, a room, uh, a therapy room, an examination room or a medical device like the MRI, later on you will see such a short example. And uh, this device or this room or this ICT system must be accessed at the same time by other people. And we need, we need to know who did what in, regarding, in regards to which specific patient uh, was, uh, was being examined. So in all this, uh, in all this, in this ecosystem in, inside the hospital, for example, we see that we need to identify. We need the system to be able to identify different actors uh, all the time, again and again, in respect of different uh, uh, actions. So in that sense, we want to be able to collect, access, share, visualize, edit uh, data, and we want this data to be medical data or personal data of other kind, and we want this to be frictionless, which means that. We don't want to enforce people to remember passwords. We don't want to enforce people uh, to stand in front of another human being in order to be able to be identified. We want this to be transparent. And I think biometrics, in my own opinion, is one of these ways that would allow us to do exactly this. In our previous study, we tried to see if we have the tools, if the technology is here to allow us to enable such services inside the hospital. So we did a very big study uh, for healthcare in Crete, and we found out that many people liked the solution, many people like this option, and they were asking more on the technicalities, like what are the legal issues, how can we integrate it, that in the hospital throughout our different uh, ICT systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we see people that they are. Uh, if I may say, uh, ready to accept this technology. And uh, I think it's going to be a good addition in the way we use uh, biometric identification to allow users to access and have control on uh, healthcare uh, related issues. Especially now in the pandemic uh, uh, era that we are living, this could also be uh, thought as a way to, to make it more uh, safe in terms of uh, infections, because we don't need to uh, touch something that is not ours. We don't need to do something. We, know to, we don't need to be in front of someone. So we can do that electronically, uh, remotely. And I think this is uh, also a good example of where we are going today. Stephanie? Thank you, Pierre. What would be your thoughts on, on this topic? Uh, hello. Uh, well, I don't think I have much to add to what uh, Claude and Manolis already said. So maybe I will just focus on the opportunity to uh, uh, publish all the results and lesson learned uh, from Panacea uh, through ISO. Uh, I think it will be uh, a very good uh, dissemination uh, uh, way to, to provide uh, good practices and a uh, good example of uh, possible implementation of biometrics in the context of healthcare. Uh, because uh, 
uh, a document published by ISO uh, can be uh, very well uh, distributed. And, uh, and yes, it will be, I think, a good way to, yes, to, to make some good publicity for uh, the use of this technology in this context and uh, to give good guidance and advice on how you should manage the privacy of the data, uh, what are the pros and cons of biometrics applied to uh, some use cases, uh, what you should take into account when you want to uh, apply biometrics, uh, either on a technical point of view, on a privacy point of view, uh, of you manage your data and stuff like that. Uh, so yes, here I will just uh, uh, yes focus my talk on the, the good opportunity of sharing uh, all this uh, lesson learned from Panacea to the public uh, for ISO. Yeah, thanks very much. In fact, I'm going to stop sharing now, Pierre, because it's your turn now to take the floor. Um, okay. And give us a just to remind, well, just to tell the audience that UPR are a biometric expert at academia and a standard specialist at international level. In fact, as I'm um, acting as French head of delegation at ISO SC37, which deals with biometrics. Thank you, Pierre. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yes. We do. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we, I, I think we see the yes 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 stage. I, I see that okay I will just change and, and I will share the second screen and it should be better okay is it better like that yes yes Okay. Okay. So this this will be a quick presentation on the on ISO and the benefits uh, from publishing a document there. So very quickly, uh, for people who don't know what really is standardization. Uh, so a standard, it is uh, published either nationally, uh, for example, in France, we have a, a national standardization committee, which is called AFNOR, or, uh, or at international level. In Europe, it will be SEN, and uh, at international level, ISO. Well, ISO is just an example, there are other uh, international standardization body like uh, IEC, for example. And yes, the goal of standards are to uh, contribute uh, to, yes, to inter interoperability between systems and to give, uh, to give the opportunity of experts to define uh, what should be the good practices and uh, what uh, is needed or required to have a, a good system which will be able to be connected to system from other providers. And from a customer point of view, it is really uh, this, what is brought by uh, using a standard. It is that if your, uh, the system you buy is conformant to a standard, it means that it should follow some rules and requirements which will guarantee uh, a minimum level of quality. And you will be able to switch to another uh, system or to connect to another system in an efficient way. Because if everyone follows the same rules, uh, you can speak together and you can connect together. So ISO, it's a worldwide uh, uh, organization. And as you can see here, there are more than 160 members. And uh, yes, in fact, the full members were able to participate in the elaboration of uh, standards, while the correspondent members, they can follow the, uh, the technical discussion, but they, they cannot take part in two uh, ballots. So in fact, they cannot decide what will be in the standard. They can just follow uh, the work. 
and uh, for subscriber, uh, in fact, they can only uh, buy standards. Yes, because uh, most of the time, uh, to access a standard, you have to buy it. Uh, so the price can be from uh, I don't know some fifty to two hundred dollars. It will depend on the on the subject or uh, the content. And uh, so if I go, yes. And in the case, in the specific case of biometrics, so there are uh, a technical committee uh, which is working on it, which is called SC37. And in fact, yes, it is, uh, we often refer it to ISO standard, but in the case of biometrics, it is in fact done by a joint committee between ISO and IEC, which is International Electronic Call Commission. And uh, so in SC37, we have six working groups. Uh, so we are composed of experts, which are nominated by uh, national standardization bodies. So it means, for example, in my case, I am an, an expert at AFNOR in France, and AFNOR nominates me to represent uh, France and uh, IDEMIA, my employer, uh, at ISO. And uh, so we, we have some, I think, uh, yes, we have be more than 120 people which are attending, well, we are, which are really active in these uh, expert groups. And so, as I said, there are six groups and the one we are more interested in uh, today is working group six, which is tackling all the jurisdictional ethics and privacy issues. And in fact, it is in this working group, uh, which is developed the technical report about biometric heat in health care. And uh, yes, uh, quick discussion about the different type of documents which are developed at uh, ISO. Uh, the most famous one, in fact, here it is the third bullet, it is international standards. Uh, so, in fact, it means that it is a document that if you choose to follow it, uh, because standards are not mandatory, uh, they are not laws, uh, they are, uh, uh, you choose voluntarily to, to follow a standard. And uh, sometimes, for example, in Europe, you can have some regulation which can make a standard as strong as a law. But uh, this is not always the case, and so it is always a choice. Uh, either, for example, your customer will ask you to to follow a standard because, for example, in, in a tender, you can have a customer who asks, "Okay, I want to buy your system only if you're following uh, all these standards." And so, in this case, uh, well, if you want to sell your product, you have to follow it. Or uh, a state can decide to, to say, okay, this standard or the recommendation of this standard becomes mandatory and are part of the regulation. And so, yes, this is the highest level, it is international standards. And when an international standard is uh, made, in fact, you cannot have any more any national standards on a similar subject because uh, you cannot contradict an international standard. Uh, just below that, there are technical specifications. Uh, which are subjects where there is not uh, enough maturity to reach uh, the consensus which is needed for standards because uh, uh, in fact, when you want to approve a standard, there are some ballots or when all the country can vote and there are quite a strict rules. For example, it is a two third majority. Uh, you have something like uh, four months open ballot to uh, everyone. And uh, this is not as uh, stringent for technical specification and for technical report, which we are talking now, it is even less uh, stringent because it is developed and uh, only inside the, the technical committee. Uh, a technical committee can decide at some point, okay, if you want to start a technical report on a, on a new subject, uh, most of the time, it is for new domains of applications, and so it will define uh, best practices and state, uh, state of the art of what is done on a subject currently. Uh, but it is not meant to be uh, uh, normative. You won't uh, define the hard requirement to follow in a technical report. 
you are just uh, giving some advices and some uh, possible implementation. And so all the work is done. So uh, the working group of ISO SC 47 uh, meets uh, two times uh, earlier, so in January and in July. And in fact, the, there is an editor which is in charge of the project. He make available a draft of uh, documents, uh, so either in March or, or in August, so just after a meeting. And then this document is open for comment and contribution for around two months. And so every registered expert can uh, make comment or contribution. And so for example, uh, I put an example of uh, the, the kind of uh, stuff you, you, can, uh, you can send. For example, here, uh, the first column, it is uh, who is commenting on which section. Uh, a column with the comment you are making and the change you are suggesting to improve uh, the current draft. And then the editor will propose a resolution. Either he accept, he proposes to accept your uh, contribution or to reject it or to modify it in, at, in some extent. But it is only proposition and it is only during the meeting that the final decision is taken with all the experts uh, gathered. And uh, then after the meeting, the, the editor implement all the changes which were decided. He produce a new draft and then we have a new iteration. And in the case of a technical report, you can have as many iteration uh, as needed. And uh, this is when the technical committee decide that the, the work is uh, mature enough and uh, you can publish it. And uh, for example, if uh, for a standard, it is uh, much more uh, limited. You have only three years, so uh, six iterations to finish a work. And yes, and a very short history of uh, this uh, project of a biometric in health scares project. Uh, so in fact, Working Group 6 initiated uh, a project in uh, 2017 on uh, this topic, uh, but in fact, they lacked contributions. So uh, they didn't have, uh, in fact, enough people involved in the healthcare uh, to be able to provide uh, valuable contributions. So the project was canceled one year later and uh, we at IDEMIA proposed to restart this project. So last year, uh, because we were able to bring some contribution from Panacea. Uh, so the project was restarted for July last year, and so we already provided uh, contribution in the last two cycles. And uh, mostly we filled some empty sections, we improved the contents, and also we proposed uh, some use cases, and uh, which will be discussed again uh, later today. And yes, just for information, uh, for example, this is the scope of a current document, uh, yes, which explains that uh, it describes potential application of biometrics in identity imaging assessment for medical, etc., etc. And so it explains that it is uh, intended to uh, give uh, advices, uh, possible implementations, uh, etc. So that's, this is it for me. Yeah. So I don't know if there was any question. Uh, not for now. I think we'll move on with the next presentation. Thank you very much, though. I think people often underestimate the amount of work that goes into standardization, and it's such an important activity. But now we're going to go back to Manolis, for who will talk us through the use cases that are in the uh, current version of the ISO technical report. So the floor is back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, I would just like to say a few words in healthcare. Usually, uh, when we talk about uh, the different technologies that uh, people embrace, uh, we are very familiar with uh, the wording of standards. So 
a few many many years ago actually two or three decades ago we were starting to discuss about uh hl7 ic icd10 or icd9 so the way we we describe data and the way we exchange data in healthcare so we knew about all the standards that were developed and now we see that many many countries as pierre said throughout all the standards they decided to accept the fact that whenever we were trying to buy uh, technology involved in these standards, uh, everybody was asking uh, to satisfy these specific uh, requirements. So this is what we hope that will also happen with biometrics and uh, healthcare. And we will see, that's why we try to describe as much, as much as possible in order to enable this standard to be used uh, by the majority of people uh, in this uh, specific uh, sector. And uh, as Stephanie said very quickly, we're just going to give you some example, some examples of what actually now is in this uh, uh, ISO draft and uh, where we would like uh, to go. So the first thing that we can think of is to allow, as we already said, and we already discussed, uh, logical authentication of medical staff inside the hospital. We want to remove the need of passwords. The, I know, I see that people here are from the IT departments of uh, healthcare organizations. The need or the resources that they need to devote in order to share passwords to people, passwords that are lost, that are not used wisely. Uh, this is a big problem. So we want to do, to take this drawback uh, and minimize it and to create a privacy preserving framework that is going to be properly implemented. It's not easy, it's not easy, but needs to be implemented and could be used not only to identify people to software uh, services, like a workstation that someone is sitting in front of it in order to access a specific service like the patient health record inside the hospital, but also to devices. So what is the drawback of this? These are the benefits. The drawback is that as Claude said and Pierre said, biometrics are not 100% accurate. We need to select what is suitable for this specific case. For example, we cannot use uh, biometrics the same way we use it uh, when we access our phone because we need to take into account the environment uh, that uh, the medical staff uh, is working on, like when they are inside a room like the MRI machine that makes a lot of noise or in a room that uh, is supposed to be dark or they are wearing masks. So all this issue must to be taken into account. So the risk and what we need to do in order to avoid this risk is yes, that we feel that we need to explore more biometrics. We need to explore more uh, the way people access, securely access uh, specific services, but we need always to have backup solutions or a different layer of security, another layer, uh, layer of security. So we feel that this is mandatory. And what is the priority? The priority is that we need to free personnel, medical staff, from logging into workstations, to different workstations, to different devices with different passwords, because this is uh, the common uh, thing that is happening today. We have a specific password that it's a super user's password in different devices, in different services. This is ticked with a sticker uh, on top of the workstation and everybody can use it. So this is one use case that we can consider. Another use case is remote access to medical data. This is more apparent today and later on with Claude, you're going to hear some use cases related to this pandemic. Remote access to medical data. This is today much more critical than ever before for two reasons. The first reason is that not all the people are actually uh, uh, are actually physically located where the data are located. So we need to be able to access it because you know, medical data usually are located inside the hospital. So uh, telepresence must be uh, more, is more important today than ever to allow a doctor outside the hospital to be able to securely access this data and also Telecare and home care today is what actually happens in order to avoid uh, uh, using uh, hospital resources for people that are, do not actually need to be inside the hospital. So the benefits here 
are the, on the fact that we would allow, would, we would enable people, we would empower people to use a secure service, to access a secure service in a safe way, to access their data, to give out their data. And this could be done for medical reasons. This is what we feel that should happen. This would enlarge sharing. This would allow people to connect directly and this would allow everybody to know where they are connected to. So biometrics is a two-way problem. You would be identified to the system and to the person uh, being uh, on the other side, but they will also identify you. So you will be able also to know that they are the persons that they're supposed to be. So you will not talk to a random uh, a random doctor that you don't actually know if he is who he claims to be, but you will talk to someone that is also identified. What is the drawback? The drawback is that we need to use some kind of IT, some kind of technology like a computer or a smartphone. But we believe today that this is a fact. So for a fact, everybody, they have a smartphone, uh, they can use a computer, or if we see it in a different way in a few years, uh, everybody would uh, do that. So the penetration of technology is a big drawback. And then we need to train people to actually stop using passwords and start using biometrics, like we do with our finger, our face, or our voice with our phone. So young patients, so patients need to be educated in that respect. Now for young patients, this is a big problem and we are concerned mainly also on this, how do you allow kids to access such a service? This is a very complex example. It is still under debate how young patients would be identified. And we are very, very sensitive in that respect. And we expect your opinion also in that respect. In these cases, the risks, patients might not want to use biometrics or will not be able to use biometrics. For example, how do you expect someone that has a face surgery to use a face biometric system? How do you expect someone that has a problem, a call, and cannot actually speak out loud correctly, uh, has to use a biometric system? So these are the drawbacks. And in that in that uh, case, we need to think of alternatives. And that's why we said at the end, we need another level of authentication and malicious usage. How can we not allow uh, persons to impersonate someone else uh, so instead of us in order to access uh, such a service? And this is where all the work that uh, uh, people are doing in biometry today is to find uh, authorized and unauthorized uh, cases of people trying to access a specific system. So is the priority high for this? I think it is, especially today. And as I said, uh, Claude Bazou will show you some examples later on in that uh, perspective. So allow me now to, to describe a general scenario. How do we create a framework for biometrics access? This is the work we did a few years ago so the idea was very simple. We identified the interactions of people with the platform and we, uh, we created a smart biometry system that was called speech X-rays and uh, everybody had to go through it to either access the medical application that was uh, installed on uh, people's phone or the medical data stored somewhere and could be accessed through a, pa a patient's uh, or a personal health record. So this is where, this is what we need to do. We need to find this point of access and we need to integrate a, a secure framework for a biometric access uh, in between humans and uh, machines. This was an example actually that was tested inside the hospital and was actually trying to identify how good could, be th could this be integrated into a healthcare organization infrastructure and how good results could uh, it produce. So we tested the accuracy, the usability, cost effectiveness, all these features that would make this, uh, these applications attractive. The results, I have to tell you, were very, very good. And we stressed our system to be used, to be tested. It was tested under uh, realistic uh, conditions. Now, another thing, something new. What comes in our lives today is devices. We know about internet of medical things uh, that is actually here. And we know on the fact that today we hear a lot about advertising of the 5G, 
of the possibility of everything being connected transparently and very fast to everything else. So we know about traditional healthcare. We know about the patient relationship doctor and how this is translated. This is uh, uh, this is changed to what we call a relation in between a patient, a device, and its doctor. So the example of uh, healthcare is changing. And in this case, biometrics need to play uh, a very important role for devices. How the doctor is being able to identify that this device is being used by this patient and how the patient can be ensured that the device that he's using will actually take the data and put it into his own medical record. So these are the problems that we are dealing today. When we talk now about the hospital, a very interesting uh, video, and I hope you are able to be to, to see it, uh, is the following. So doctors come into an MRI, they try to identify themselves, and now the MRI knows that, knows that this specific doctor that has issued this examination is the one claiming to be, and the patient is being examined. So no unauthorized access to any medical equipment inside the hospital. This is what we want to, to do. Sorry. So the benefits. Technology today can provide the technical infrastructure, the technical components, but we need to commit. We need to commit in a higher level and we need to provide these policy requirements from the stakeholders that would allow the embrace of this technology. So there is a digital transformation that had happened and we need to use it. Today, more than ever, we need to take advantage of ICT and we need to allow humans to use all the resources that we have available. And by saying that, my last slides would be about the market. So is this, is this something we do for research? Do we try to input things to an ISO committee to create an ISO standard just because we're doing research? The answer is no. The future of healthcare and cybersecurity clearly identifies that one of the main drivers is identity and access management, is the fact that we need to find a new way of identifying of uh, knowing who this person is that is trying to access a device or a system. And this is very important because we know that there is a new regulation and we, knew, we need to integrate it in the new MDR regulation about medical device, about the way we build the medical device, about the way we supply medical devices. So now we need to educate everyone to disseminate the work that we are doing here and the work that we are doing in all the relevant projects to be able to change supply chains and to allow hospitals and to allow healthcare organizations to be serviced and to be uh, to have access to the to this uh, new uh, fancy equipment and devices and services and with this i would like to conclude uh, my discussion about what we're trying to do with the standard the iso standards and the use cases we have here i want to emphasize more on what i find very attractive so what i am and what I have will be my credentials to access any service. I don't need to remember any number or any password. I can bring my own device. I can be part of the IO, IoT ecosystem. I can be part of the gen next generation of internet uh, resources to be able to communicate in an easy way, in a frictional way, in order to be identified through biometry and through uh, uh, ICT technologies inside a hospital to allow access to my data to someone else, to enable, uh, to, uh, to get access to my data, to share my data, to do whatever I want. And this can be done in a GDPR compliant way with all the legal aspects, data migrating aspects, moral issues, and also cost issues to be resolved. So we don't expect people to use something more than the things that they have. They, we don't expect them to spend more money for this. No, we just need them to use the technology that we have today in a different, uh, in a different manner. So with this, I would like to conclude uh, my presentation. I would like to thank you, Stephanie, the floor is back to you and the audience. Yeah, thank you very much. In fact, we'd like to ask the very good people in the audience to now um, complete another poll, which Rita will launch now. 
Thanks, Rita. Um, just, we just want to get a little bit of your feedback on the use cases that you've heard about so far. So um, it should be the other poll. Sorry, Rita, not this one. Um, Yes, I'm, I'm having some problems in. Uh, okay, let right me now. let and me try. It's like it should be visible um, to everyone. Okay, I, yeah, I, that's right. Yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. No worries. So, how useful would you, do you find the use cases that we've just been um, learning about in terms of solving issues of identity management in in healthcare? Um, if we can have a few more voters. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. We will have a, an opportunity in a short while to get your direct feedback, okay, on after we've heard about some new use cases that Claude will be presenting. Those are the ones, these are the ones that we have so far in the ISO technical report. Okay, we'll just hang on just another minute. Um, we have um, actually uh, quite a lot of people that vote. It is more than the half. Oh, so yeah, there's we'll... a couple more have just come in, Rita. Please right. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we will keep still the, the poll for yeah. the others to vote. Yeah. We'll wait for one minute, 50 seconds, okay? And then we'll, okay. we'll launch the results. Or maybe, yeah, maybe we could stop at 140. Yeah, and then another, another vote's just come in. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we can launch the uh, results, Rita. Um, so here, actually, we have um, more than 70% of people define it quite useful, and the 30% of remaining people define it as very useful. Lovely. Okay, I think we can close now because I'd like to pass the floor to Claude. Um, so we've learned then so far about the use cases yes, in the technical report. We'll now turn our attention to another nine use cases for potential inclusion. Claude is um, head of products at Idemia, and again, as we where you heard, we met her also in the round table. Um, just a, 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 um, a note for our, our very good participants this morning. If you could make it, there are nine uh, use cases and we'll be asking you to select four of them after the, this presentation. So maybe it might be if you, one of them does, one or, or four actually strike you as being particularly important and, and useful in the healthcare sector, please make a note of the number. Okay, so thanks. I think we can, we just close the poll and I'll pass the floor to you, Claude. Thanks very much. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I have a small uh, issue with showing the right screen um, because when I, I have my screen uh, displayed, I am wait, I'm losing the, um, uh, okay, so but perhaps I'm going to show my slide, just not to lose slide because it's not very important, not in the expected format. So I hope everyone will be able to see them anyway. Um, okay. Okay, so um, are, I hope you can see uh, the slides. Uh, so just let me recap where we are with this um, technical report writing. So basically we got a document that had some broad ideas on the use of biometric in healthcare. Uh, so we looked at it, uh, both Manolis and I, and we start adding details, but we didn't know exactly how to make it progress. And of course, we started to think of asking you uh, how to, to make it 
more relevant, at least on my side, I am a completely ignorant in healthcare. Okay, so I, I needed help. It was obvious to me. Uh, so um, the usual goal of a technical report is more about best, best practices. But in order to, to give best practices, we first need to select use cases. And there are many use cases in the field of biometrics in healthcare. It's, there are so many possibilities. Uh, so we started to describe two use cases that Manolis has already shown. And we thought, okay, we can, we may describe more and dig more into those use cases or specific use cases in order to determine uh, how they should be implemented and what are the constraints and what are the pros and cons, et cetera, and what are the risks and benefits. Therefore, uh, we, we, we described two use cases and sent it back to ISO. And we had uh, a great feedback, actually. Uh, and the feedback was, right, it's a good way to uh, start doing that but don't do it without your partners because it's meaningless if you have no people from me the medical domain involved you should do that with people actually working in hospitals or in the healthcare so this is where we are today where we are is selecting use cases into which we can a little bit give more thinking but that are the most important for you right so Maybe the use case I'm going to present are not the one you prefer. And of course, you will be able to describe more in case um, you think some obvious use case uh, are coming to your mind. And, and we will open the discussion afterwards. However, we have selected, Manolis and I, nine, new, nine or eight, I don't remember, a number of use cases. I think it's eight. And uh, so let me go to them. Uh, so the first one, uh, the, so for each use case, we have a short presentation and for those who are going to be, which are going to be selected, we will try to complement this table, but I'm not going to show this table in the first place. I'm going to show short description of a number of use cases, and then we would like to see your feedback. So this is the goal of this exercise. So let me go through the use cases and please interrupt in case it's necessary because uh, I, I'm, I'm not in the medical domain, so I may say things that are not suitable. So do, not, do not hesitate. I don't know exactly how, how it works, by the way, Stephanie. Uh, so uh, if you notice that someone uh, has uh, something to say, please uh, interrupt me. I don't know how, how yeah. it works. Yeah, no. You can go ahead, Claude. I've asked the participants to make a note of the number of the use case that they feel are, is particularly important in their in the healthcare domain. Okay, so we, yeah, so we, we'll, and then we'll do a poll afterwards to select the top four. Okay, so okay, yeah, the floor is yours. Thanks. Okay, so the first use case is the one that we have developed in Panacea. It's basically uh, uh, an access control to every computers and devices within a hospital, right? So the idea is that each time you connect and you may connect to the radio, uh, um, radiology equipment at one time and then to one computer uh, and etc., you will have the same access control, which is at the Windows level. So there is currently a limitation because it's a Windows only, but this is only a research um, project. So this is really controlling all the devices of the hospital by an access control, a login, um, that is going to be um, suitable for all practitioners in the hospital. So that's the first use case. Let's go to the second use case. So the second use case involves two people, a doctor and a patient, because it's about teleconsultation. So teleconsultation, it, we think about a platform that would put in contact two people, the patient and the doctor. So for the patient, it's very interesting to know that there is a, a, doc, a, a, a platform 
to that has control that the doctor is really a doctor because they feel, of course, that someone they don't know because this may happen in teleconsultation may come in and may not be reliable. It's their own health, so it's important. And and the doctor would need to know something about the patient if if he could get access to some record about what happened to the health of this person and also knows something about the insurance and social security to make sure that payment will be ensured. This may be taken into, into account by the platform. So there is a mutual interest in being connected in a safe way from the doctor knowing a little bit about the patient and for the patient knowing a little about the doctor and the fact that he was selected somehow by a platform. So this is mutual, it's not really the usual term of mutual authentication, but it's two, two authentication, dual authentication, access control. So that's our second use case. So let me move on to the third use case. The third use case is quite similar to the first use case but um, it's only for some applications within the hospital, right? So the idea is instead of moving your whole infrastructure, you will start with some application in which you will put basically the same access control than the one that have been described for use quest one, but progressively. And also the other benefit is to see how medical personnel react to this new technology. Uh, so that's the third use case. I hope it's clear. Uh, the, th the, the fourth use case is also quite basic. It's physical access control. For, so for those of you who are familiar with access control, there are basically two kinds. One kind is logical access control when you access to a system, to a device, to an, uh, something where there is IT. Physical access control is simply accessing a building, a room, etc. Uh, so this is something that um, we discussed in IDEMIA. That's one of the few examples where uh, the, uh, some hospitals want an access control, a physical access control, mostly um, to the, the room where there are um, medicines. Uh, this is something very critical because they are often stolen. And it's very important also that this is very fluid. Uh, so this has a, a number of conditions due to GDPR, so somebody would be close to it, should not have his or her biometric stolen, if I may say so. Uh, it has to be restricted to the people who are volunteers, etc. But physical access control is for me an obvious use case within the hospital. The fifth use case uh, is the checking of patient within the hospital. So today, at least in my own experience, which is extremely limited, uh, people have a plastic bracelet with a, a small piece of paper inside. And uh, that the way we know that this operation or this treatment uh, has to be given to this person. And because nurses and doctors are changing every day, uh, it's required to know who the patient is and what is supposed to happen to this patient. So today it's, it's, it's with this wristband that it's do, it is done. However, it's, um, it's, um, it could be done also with biometrics. And the benefit of course is that you cannot take it out. You cannot exchange with someone else. If, if it falls under water, it's not damaged. So it's, it's more linked to the patient himself than something that is attached to the patient. Also in case of crisis, um, it may be lost, this additional thing that you put, while uh, hopefully your face and uh, fingers or whatever are not going to be uh, lost and identification will still be possible. So this is use case five. Uh, the, 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 the sixth use case was in fact something that I found within the initial document of ISO. 
And I, I, I don't know whether it's an issue once again, because I don't know uh, the, the medical domain um, well enough, but as a patient, I think it's interesting. So basically what the uh, preliminary version of the ISO document was saying uh, was that it's not so clear when someone claims, okay, I'm a physio physiotherapist or I am whatever, I'm uh, uh, a doctor specialized in heart, heart disease or, or whatever. Uh, it's not completely clear to be convinced that this is true. So there is a whole process of checking whether this person really has the qualification he or she claims he or she has. Right. Uh, so the idea, uh, but I don't know whether it's realistic or not, would be to do um, a European level recording of doctors and nurses and every people with a medical expertise. And then it could be extremely easy to prove with biometrics and to retrieve all your diplomas, etc. The other thing that could be used with this kind of registry is some kind of identity to medical people so that they could talk to each other. So the idea is, okay, I'm a doctor and a patient with a tourist arrived and he has, um, some, he has something that I have to address, but it would be much better if I could contact his usual doctor or maybe the hospital where he's usually cured and access his or her um, health record. Uh, in which case, this will give this person a way to prove his or her identity as a doctor and get confidence of the usual doctor of the patient to get details on the history of this patient. So it could be an, something like a digital identities for medical practitioners. And it, I, I think it would be extremely beneficial. But once again, it's for you to, to, to tell me. I have no idea. Um, whether this could be acceptable for, 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 do, for doctors. I, I don't know. Uh, use case seven is about uh, remote monitoring of patients, right? Uh, so as Manolis explained, there are more and more IoT devices around that are linked to a patient and that can be used to monitor the health but sometimes also they are inside their body or they may influence uh, the treatments, etc. So basically the, those devices are getting data outside that could be accessed for some doctors, but also some of them could be changed uh, so that the influence on, on the patient, the way they are, um, uh, they, they um, for, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing words because it's really a domain I don't know. But imagine, for instance, uh, that you have a pacemaker, you could change um, the rate. So they, they could be adjusted by the doctors. I'm sorry about the bad vocabulary. Uh, so the idea would be some kind of access control for doctors to the medical device of some patients. So there, there could be some authorization to uh, saying, a, a patient or somebody in charge of a patient managing the authorization of some institution, medical institution or doctors. So that's use case seven. Uh, about use case eight and nine, they were added yesterday by Manalis. So if it's okay with you, I'm sure you are going to explain them much better than I can. It's about the pandemic. So it's recent experience from Manolis. Is it okay with you, Manolis, if I... Yes, yes, of course, I can say a few words about this. Okay, so okay. Uh, if, if you could do it, it would be, I think, better for me. Okay, so the last uh, two use cases, actually, uh, I think they are devoted uh, to the problems we face today. So one of the most important problems today is, um, was, until a few months ago, to identify a new vaccine for COVID. And then after that, we had to find ways to distribute this uh, vaccine throughout the world in different countries. And then each country had to define uh, a schedule, a vaccine scheduler, that would, that would allow all the people uh, to be vaccinated. This is a very, very big problem because 
it involves many different stakeholders and at the end we need to know exactly who got vaccinated and uh, and uh, where he was vaccinated so in that sense if you look at the, um, we are taking as an example the greek uh, uh, the greek uh, vaccine scheduler that was created so it, it asks people to log in again and again, providing different credentials for them. And this is very difficult, especially for the older people. So the idea is to be able to identify people using, uh, as we said before, a frictional system in order to get access to this vaccine information, where their vaccination should take place, what happens, uh, what will happen with them, et cetera, et cetera. At this stage also, it's not very clear whether this scheduler is able to provide information to uh, the personnel that will actually perform the vaccination to tell them whether I face a significant uh, chronic disease and I, I should be careful. For example, the Pfizer uh, vaccine uh, is being advised uh, to, to tell to the, to the patients, to the citizens, to avoid taking drugs that will, uh, uh, sort, will decrease uh, the immunity of their system, like rheumatoid uh, drugs, et cetera, et cetera. So all these things could be avoided if we had a biometric system that was able to identify uniquely and securely the individual, provide the information to both parties and make sure that, that all parties had the appropriate information for what we call vaccination in terms of COVID. So this is one use case that could be very, uh, very interesting. And uh, this is intended for the public health domain. So it's a country-wise use case, and it is a service, uh, a new service that hospitals and healthcare organizations need to provide. Okay. So I'm switching to the last use case. So there were yes. not nine of them. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, so this, this use case is about self-testing. So what actually happens with the pandemic? Uh, from uh, the epidemiology point of view, there are three stages. In the first stage, we only perform PCR or genomic tests that we can uniquely and securely identify uh, the virus uh, that exists or doesn't exist into a human body. As the pandemic, as the uh, yes, the pandemic progresses, as the, as the disease progresses and infects more and more people, and maybe m some people are getting vaccinated, so we're starting to build this immunity. Uh, defense in, against the virus, we accept that for the test, for uh, identifying the incidence, this would be uh, genetic-based PCR and uh, antigen-based, which is the rapid test that we all know today. At the third, third stage, actually the stage we are now, we need, we need to introduce self-testing. So now we need to produce cheap uh, rapid tests that could be used by all individuals and we need to, to create an ICT platform to allow these individuals to input their data. So it's a different type of epidemiology monitoring for this pandemic. Again, as an example, uh, we, we take uh, the Greek uh, case where you see that the government has created some specific websites that would uh, allow people first to find information about the vaccine and second to find information about this self-testing and again this platform because we don't have a frictional system needs to go through a specific identification uh, workflow that uh, needs for me to input my social security number different passwords from different domains in order to make sure that to make sure that i am the one that i'm supposed to be so again this is a case for public health for something we face today. Okay, so that was the last use case. Uh, I don't know whether uh, it's uh, clear or not. If you have questions, of course, uh, I, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and uh, if you have questions, of course, we are well, available for questions. Much. Yes, I think very interesting set of use cases, but we'll now ask the very good people in the audience to. Um, respond to this final poll, which Rita will launch. Um, this is a multiple choice because we'd like to ask you to select the, your top four based on what you think would be most useful or important um, or acceptable in a healthcare environment. 
okay um and we'll we'll use this as a we'll then you know delve a bit more deeply in the interactive part on the four selected use cases okay um i've numbered them i hope it's clear um So thank you very much. Keep the votes coming in. Your feedback is, is truly appreciated. And just, I just one more, there's a point that I'd like to pick up that uh, Manolis mentioned before, and that's a reminder that the, the new regulation on medical devices is coming into effect uh, in May. So not, not, we're very close to that deadline now. So this is also an important um, regulation to bear in mind, I think, very important that we make sure our medical devices are safe and secure. So thank you. We've got over 60% of people have voted. We'll just hang on just a little bit longer before we launch the results. And let's hope we have a, a clear, we have four clear winners. Um, Okay, Rita, I think we get to 1.40, 1 minute 40. So I think we can share the results now, Rita. Thank you, everybody, for voting. So, well, the top one is use case. Um, it's going to take me a minute to vote this one out. Bear with me. Use case seven is a, is a, a pretty good winner on 71%. Um, oh. Then we have... I think use case yep. five. Is five, the most. yeah, yeah. I just noticed that, yeah. Yep. Use case five. I can't see all the way down, so just bear with me a second. Use case eight is on and nine. fifty-seven percent and nine. Yeah. And uh, seven, I think it's. Uh, I think it's uh, number one. If you go, use case seven, e health remote monitoring of patients. Uh, okay, so we'll go for those then. Then four. Okay. Those four. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So what we're going, what we're going to do now, when we're going to. Um, my colleague Rita will allow participants to unmute. Okay. Um, I think we can share the results first, though, Rita, before we do that. And we'd like to pass the floor to our to our participants. And um, first of all, we'd like to ask you to introduce yourselves. Okay. There may be people on my slide deck that I are not included there, so. We will ask the, those very good people to put their names in the chat. Okay, I think we can, let's share the results. Sorry, the audience can't see them. Okay, so there we go. So those are our top top four use cases there. Um, so I think we can stop sharing the results. Okay, um, so thank you very much for voting. Um, I'm just going to open my slide deck a second. Okay, so here, this is the this is when we now turn to the audience. Um, this is the list that we had yet last night, but I know that we've had some more participants this morning. Um, so if those very good people could put their names in the chat, and we'll try and make sure we'll make a note of them, and I will. Um, then and allow those people to speak as well. So um, if the person is not in the audience or does not want to speak, we'll just move on to the next one. But we'll start with this list of participants. So with Kalia being the first one on the list. Okay, thank you. So, you know, we'll ask you to please give, say your name, your affiliation and your role within that affiliation. So thanks very much. And a very warm welcome to you all. So if Kalia is not on the line, um, could and Manos please present himself? Hello? 
Rita, you need to un give them the opportunity, the attention yeah, say, to, to unmute. Okay. Uh, so, um, let's say all, all the attendees to this uh, workshop today have actually right now the possibility to unmute themselves and talk. Uh, so you, you can do it uh, really just uh, pressing on the uh, little icon that is on the right side, uh, which is a kind of speaker. So if you're just pressing it, you can actually unmute yourself and you can uh, start presenting. Yeah, I'm just looking now at the participants actually. Um, I don't think we have Kalia on the line this morning, but we do have Manos. Manos, if you'd like to unmute. Yes, hello. Yeah, hello, thank you. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay, hello, I am Manos Athanatos. I work uh, at fourth uh, as uh, Anolis. Uh, I am a technical project manager working on various cybersecurity projects and uh, also I am the standardization leader for a project called CyberSign, and that is why mainly I enjoyed your uh, your presentation today to see how you uh, move towards the standardization parts of Panacea. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So um, I don't see Maria online either, or I'm just looking to see if Georgios is here with us. If not, we'll move on to another person. Uh, yeah, we have George Campos, Campas online. I'm asking him to unmute. Don't know if you can do that, please, George. Or if you can try to unmute him, Rita. Yes, I'm also trying to... Yeah, I, I, it doesn't seem to be working, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Mm, well, never mind. We do have Kay Kelly, though, on the line. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself, Kay. Thank you. Hello, hi. Um, my name is Kay Kelly. I'm based in Ireland. I work for the Irish uh, Health Service Executive, the HSE. I, I'm an IT project manager. I've joined the health, um, this area just in the last 18 months, so new to health, um, but I have a particular interest in data protection. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just checking to see if we have the next person on the list. I don't think so. Just bear with me while we do this. Um, No, but we do have Sabina Magalini, who is the coordinator of um, Hannah Chair. Sabina, hello. if you'd... Yeah, hello. hello, Sabina. I managed to unmute it. Yes, <laughs> Good. well done. <laughs> so, I'm, yes. an, I'm an emergency surgeon, and I'm uh, um, the coordinator of the Panacea Project. Uh, uh, our, uh, our hospital, the Fondazione Policlinico Gemelli, has a strong commitment towards medical security. And uh, some of these use cases are the ones that we proposed. So I, I, I would like to discuss with you uh, for, further on after the presentations. Lovely, thank you very much, uh, Sabina. Um, I'm just looking at the participant list. Um, maybe Alessandra Casaroli would also like to present herself. You can um, yes. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Hello. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Alessandra Casaroli. I'm a clinical biomedical engineer, and uh, I work at the Panacea project in uh, the technical part. Thank you very much. And the next person I would call would be Alessandro Masciolino. You can unmute and give us a presentation. <clears throat> yeah, hello. Okay, there seems to be a problem there. Let's move on to uh, Manix McAllister. You 
can unmute and give us a quick presentation of yourself. If not, we'll move on to somebody else. I see that Peter Daly is on the line. So, P Peter, if you can unmute, and then we'll pass on to the other Peter, which is Peter Roche. Hi, this is Peter Daly. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, the co currently working in the health service. I'm um, I'm the COVID project manager for the hospital group in the south of Ireland. We have ten hospitals. Thanks. Thank yeah. Thank you. Um, Peter Roche, Roche, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Peter Roche. I'm uh, also um, a health service. Uh, executive uh, from Ireland. I suppose um, I prior to COVID, I was the architecture lead for the National Electronic Health Record. And um, at the moment, I'm working on the co uh, vaccination program and I suppose responsibility for um, scheduling and clinic management for, for the rollout of, of vaccines here in Ireland. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. All the very best with that. Such an important job that you have there. So, OK, let's pick someone else. I want another. Um, person from Ireland on Sline, if you'd like to say a couple of words about yourself. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Don Sline, I'm a director of ICEM, the Centre for Emergency Management. We're involved in the Panacea Project, and uh, your webinar was most interesting. It's an area that I know very little about, but I found it very informative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, we'll now pass the floor to Catriona Frawley. Thank you. You can unmute. Doesn't all the mic doesn't seem to always unmute, unfortunately. So do bear with us on this. Um, if not, I'll look um, for someone else. There's Manix, Manix and Callister again. If he wants to have another try, or if not, we'll go to Evangelis Marcus. Evangelis. Hello. Hello. I'm uh, Vagil Markakis. I'm uh, coming from the Helen Mediterranean University uh, Research Center where I'm principal analysis, uh, principal investigator. Uh, I am also part of uh, the core team of Sphinx. So we are here in order to see what our sister project is uh, doing. And uh, I'm very interested in the part of uh, biometrics and the two-factor authentication that uh, Manos, uh, Spanakis, and uh, uh, Claudia from uh, IDEM has presented. It's a very interesting approach. Although I see some uh, problems with uh, doctors trying to find their uh, phone and uh, see how they will uh, be able to handle this uh, uh, new way of authentication. This must be, I think that the part of behavioral uh, analysis of the way they interact with the computer must also be integrated in such a system in order to make a, a verification some time and not all the time through a mobile. Uh, of course, this is an open uh, suggestion and discussion that we would like to be happy uh, to work with the, the other people in that area. Uh, that's all. And uh, thank you for this nice and successful workshop. Thank you very much. OK, so now we'll go through the use cases then that will, that have been selected by you very good people. Um, if we'd like perhaps to start with work with use case number five. So just to maybe Manolis or Claude could just give us a quick summary of what that use case is about. Um, remember that uh, this is to the to our participants. You can unmute yourself and make a comment, okay? Um, afterwards. So, my knowledge, if we could just or Claude, yeah. remind yeah, us that, okay. yeah, use case five. Mm -hmm. uh, but perhaps I should show the slide uh, again yeah. and maybe the other slide <clears throat> with the benefit and drawbacks. So, let's yes. start with use uh -huh. case. Five, so yeah, I'm, I've uh, stopped sharing, sharing, so yeah, you can. Do uh, I'm that. sharing again. Uh, uh, hopefully, it's okay. Can you see it? 
Yes. Okay, so the uh, the idea is to check the patient identity in the hospital uh, in order to make sure that the right treatment operation, etc., is given to the right person. Right. So uh, we um, we made the first analysis, but really high level. So we are um, really expecting your help here. Uh, so the benefit is, of course, to reduce the risk of error in the, tra in the treatment. And uh, in, uh, in this current situation of pandemic, I don't know whether it's the same within um, all Europe, but what I hear in, here in France uh, from doctors is that the medical staff is exhausted. So it's, it's a situation where errors may happen. Uh, so the, the idea is one of, uh, of the benefit is that it's linked to the patient himself or herself, not to something added that can be lost, for instance, in, in, in the case of earthquake or, or some other catastrophic event. And it's, it can be subject to damage because, of course, your finger may be, may, may be uh, damaged, but uh, not so much as a little bit of plastic added on the patient. So the drawback is that it's not part of what the medical personnel is used to do. So um, basically scanning a patient somehow is not something they do. I don't know exactly whether this is acceptable and uh, of course, it's always the same as all biometric. Uh, so for instance, a person who has, uh, if we select fingerprints for some reason, patients with very bad fingerprints, and this happens, for instance, for people working uh, uh, in the construction domain because um, uh, they, some, um, the, the finger are very damaged, may not be eligible. So it will not cover all patients. Uh, the, um, the risk is that patient may not accept biometrics because it's, it's quite interesting, by the way, <clears throat> that the use case you selected, only one of them <clears throat> is on the medical side. All the others are on the patient side. And my personal feeling, but that's only my personal feeling, is that doctors is a population that is easier to convince that most patient, but I may be wrong. I, I mean, and and so the other uh, problem I see, the other risk, is um, that for GDPR you need to prove that the effort and the fact of putting biometrics is proportional to the problem. So it's it's a problem to me. It may not be a problem to you. Of course, it's simply a problem to me because I have no idea on whether this is a frequent issue of not being able to identify properly a patient with existing uh, measures. So I would like you to comment on that and give me what you think are the benefits, drawbacks, the risk, and um, the priority of this use case. Yeah. So anyone on, on, in the audience can simply unmute and ask a question or make a comment about this, or even say why they, if you actually selected this use case, why you selected it. Okay, that would be, we would really appreciate you coming up, you know, unmuting this if you can. I know some of you have some technical issues with this, but you know, any comments that you can give us, it's very much appreciated. So please, anyone take, feel free to take the floor and give us your comments on use case five. Do we have someone in the audience who selected this um, use case who would like to say why they selected it? No, we don't seem to have anyone offering to comment on it. Okay. Um, maybe we can move on. I don't know. Unless our Claude or Manolis or Pierre would like to add anything here? Uh, 
Maybe I could offer a comment yes. from, a, from a doctor's side. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I didn't select this uh, use case because obviously doctors see things from their side and not from the patient's side. But in a way, it's very, very interesting uh, psychologically because it means that this uh, is a fear of the patients of being, uh, um, if you see it from a patient's side, probably you're scared that they don't uh, recognize you or they're giving you the wrong kind of uh, operation. It's, uh, it's very interesting that people ha have selected this. I, I see um, an importance of this use case in emergencies, you know, in earthquakes or uh, in situations where you, there is much, um, there are a lot of patients you don't know how to deal with them. Maybe some of them are unidentified. Um, I mean, it's more for an emergency because usually inside hospitals, it's, it's not very frequent that you mistake one patient for another. Okay, so it's, uh, as you were correctly saying, how, how often does this happen? Okay, that, that I think that yeah. should mm -hmm. be taken into consideration. Yeah. Because, you know, biometrics is to, uh, at least the, the way I see it, to solve your everyday problems, all those mm -hmm. nuisances that you have of uh, having always to log in to do any medical um, uh, operation from, from a surgical operation to prescribing medicine to um, uh, updating the system on the patient's conditions that morning. Uh, so I, I see it from an operator's point of view, but if you see it from a, a lay point of view, uh, I think it's interesting because I think this is one of the fears people have of being exchanged for someone else and giving the wrong medical yeah. treatment. Well, exactly, not, and, and probably not just a, an emergency like an earthquake or some other disaster. It could also be helpful for people who've been displaced, yeah, and have had to migrate to somewhere else and maybe in that process they've lost their passport or, or don't have a passport or other forms of identification so yeah that's a very nice point that you raised there Sabina. If there are no other um, comments on use case five I suggest we move on to use case number seven. So, sorry I'm taking Notes. Yeah. <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay, so e use case seven was about e-health. And I think in the domain of e-health, you could find a number of use cases. So this one concentrate on remote monitoring of patient. So that's basically the only one where it's planned that medical people will authenticate so that the patient once again has a better confidence on who may act on his or her device, right? Uh, so the, once again, the analysis here is extremely um, preliminary. So the benefits is, is, is like in use case one. So in use case one, I am going to go back to use case one. Uh, it's, uh, the benefit is reliable access control, of course, which is mandatory for uh, secu cyber security, because if there is no access control, if anyone is able to access, then uh, there are, of course, security holes. And then, of course, you have the benefit of biometrics is removing pass passwords because they are not easy to manage. And uh, it's it can be privacy preserving if, if well implemented. So if you, are, if you don't have a centralized database of, uh, of um, biometric templates, which is what we have implemented in Panacea. And uh, it's quite well suited to shared devices and terminals. So that's the benefit. And the benefit, so I'm jumping back to uh, this one, is that only the use case one was only within the hospital, and here it goes beyond the hospital to uh, devices that could be potentially life critical. So it's it's um, I think it's uh, an interesting benefit. The drawback is also quite the same as in use case one. So I'm going to jump back to use case one. Uh, so um, the, the drawback is that hospital personnel may wear gloves, masks, etc. So it's not easy to capture the biometrics. 
Um, so for those of you who uh, are not part of Panacea, um, basically masks are still uh, limited uh, the, um, the 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 uh, the performances of biometrics, but now we get pretty good performances with usual mask, I would say. If it's really a mask that leaves only the eyes visible, probably not. But mask that goes on uh, in the middle of the cheeks and only uh, obfuscate the nose and the mouth, the the um, the um, um, the performances are acceptable, but of course gloves are gloves. I mean, the, I, I think some some attempts have been made. So Pierre, you may be more aware than I am to have um, um, the capture of um, of fingerprints through uh, thin gloves, but I don't know where we have with that. Uh, so as we said already, biometrics are never one hundred percent accurate. And uh, managing the trade-off, because it's something new in hospitals for IT managers, would require the help of the uh, the vendors of the um, the um, biometric solution. Okay, so on top of that, I'm sorry, I'm switching back. Uh, we uh, we need to understand practically how this could work in case of emergency. Because if you ask for authorization in case uh, to access uh, the, the data or, or maybe the setting of a device, then you may have emergency situations. So it, it must not lock the process because otherwise it, it would be a disaster. Uh, so it's, it's something that probably uh, is, uh, can be solved, but I, I don't know how. Uh, so the risk, once again, so I'm not going to go back, back and, uh, and forth. However, uh, the, the, the risk is that you need a backup strategy and the backup strategy may cause a security hole. But I don't think it's so much an issue with doctors. I would be more worried with biometric on patients because many will try to escape. However, doctors, okay, they, they may um, they may not accept it, but I, I would think a majority would, like, would accept it. But what, what goes with it is an authorization mechanism where people are authorized to read or uh, act on the device of a person and they may not like it. Okay, and the priority is for us quite high because this is something in development. So we think it's quite important. So the, this is, I think, quite preliminary. So I don't know whether you have comments. I hope you have comments. Yeah, yeah. maybe we could invite the, uh, one of the participants or more than one participant who chose this use case to tell us why they chose it. That would be really appreciated. And if you have any further comments or questions to make about the use case, so please feel free to unmute and, and give us your give us your opinions. Is there someone in the audience who would like to um, comment, please? Hey, uh, hello, this is Evangelos. Hello. Maybe it will be very interesting to see how you consider also parts of uh, the mask or gloves that uh, the doctors are using uh, most of the time. And uh, biometrics can be one thing, but if they use uh, gloves and they must put them out in order to log in, and then put again the new ones. It's a process that Maybe it would be interesting to see if you have considered uh, maybe eye or uh, face recognition and, uh, in order to make faster the approach. Uh, uh, yes. Yep. Please. Go, please. go. No, Claude. Okay. okay but my, my comment on that is that we, we selected um, face for Padanchea project. Uh, Due to the glove issue, and because at the, at the time of Panacea, 
there was uh, on, ongoing work starting with the mask uh, because it was an obvious need in airports and uh, for, I mean, not only for hospital personnel, for most people now, because most people have to wear a mask uh, in public places. So if you want to use um, face biometric in public places, we knew it was something that we had to address. Uh, so um, the, 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 the biometric selections is, is something that is, is very important. However, I, I will send you uh, where we are with, with mask, where the NIST is in, in the evaluation. And, and you will see that, well, of course, I don't know whether um, the match mask one is in hospital are the ones that are considered by the NIST. I would tend to think so. I'm not sure. Uh, I I think it's it's a problem that has been quite well addressed by a number of institutions. You are, Claude, you are quite right. And to to answer back to to Vangelis about this issue, yes, there are uh, there are uh, drawbacks on the fact that uh, when we want to describe someone's identity in rega regarding what he is or what. Uh, his face looks like or what his voice looks like. Uh, you need to think more uh, in the open, like these features that we want to describe are not actually explainable. They are features that are uh, being resulted through a complicated machine learning uh, problem. So this helps a system identify specific uh, templates, whether they belong to this person or to another person. So in that regard, the fact that we're not covering the whole page with a face mask like we do now with COVID could be a case where we could discuss uh, the FAR limits of whether this could, uh, this could res result in a good match, in a positive match or not. Um, in fact, if you look at the major mobile manufacturers, they decided not to include the, the mouth area to be able to identify someone, but they mainly include the eyes area to be able to identify someone, for example. Uh, nevertheless, this specific use case, it's not explicitly, the problem is not explicitly uh, the means of biometrics. The means of biometrics could be different. It could be the voice, it could be the eyes, it could be the face, as you said, very correct, as you said. Uh, it could be the fingerprint, it could be anything, anything that could describe who someone is. Also, another thing about uh, the phone, because I think it was there was a question of how the people could use the phone. Uh, I, I think the new technologies in mobile phones allow us to use it, whether we wear or we don't wear uh, some apparel or something, some gloves or something, etc. So they allow us to use it uh, disregarding this uh, problem. So this is this is something evolving. This is something that will happen soon, maybe. It's not here today, but will happen soon. Again, going back to, to the use case, the interesting thing about this specific use case, it's not actually the means. It's the fact that both sides can identify themselves. So the patients, the device, the device to the patients, the medical doctor to the device, the device to the medical doctors, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a bilateral exchange of identities in that essence, something that we cannot do today. We cannot ask a device to log in somewhere. This is very strange to happen. Or if this something happens, it's very restricted in terms of a specific service. So this could be, this is for me, uh, the innovative thing, how we can identify all the actors in an e-health remote monitoring service in order to ensure that this specific patient uses this specific device and there is a specific doctor monitoring and making an assumption and making a diagnosis or a treatment or issuing an alert. I think what Manoli says is very, very interesting because at the beginning of the project, we did not consider the patient as uh, something that was in our domain, but this, this use case and the people that voted it uh, really, brings us to think that we have to extend this system outside of the, the, the domain we had considered at the beginning. Correctly, Sabina, correctly. This is, I think, again, we're going back to the way uh, 
because you know doctors in my in my opinion they do things for other people they do things for the patient so they just want to make sure as Sabina says what the patient how how the patient is treated in terms of uh, how fast he's treated uh, how well he's treated etc etc how can we improve it and i think this is the essence of this these days yes Yeah. Well, actually, it has been restricted here as being more on the doctor side. So it's really um, not authentication the patient. So maybe we should rephrase. Do you think we should here talk about the identification of the patient to the device? I, I don't know. It was, it, it, it was not part of the initial use case. It was only the doctors. It was only making the patient confident that his or her device will not going to be accessed uh, widely. And either to gather his or her data or to modify the settings uh, in so, some unsuitable way. We can, we can rephrase. We it we can, be... Yes, we can rephrase because uh, I think this is, uh, it's, all, it's the same thing. I mean, it's, uh, it's pre-assumed that in order for the patient to, to feel assured that uh, the medical uh, pr practitioners are who they claim to be, the medical practitioners must be ensured by us now that the patient is who he claims to be. So it's it always goes uh, both ways. Uh, but I, I have a question about, uh, about doctors. So usually do we don't expect doctors to, to, to be misinformed of who is the patient that has been treated, right? This is something that we need to exclude from the use case or we can leave it? Well, the, the, the practice is that since uh, things, uh, I don't know, bad things happen. No, there are examples of people who are having the operation on the wrong side. There are various cases to, described for nephrectomy. Also, people have been amputated on the wrong leg. You know, things like that happen. In the operative room checklist, that, which the patient has to go through before an, an operation, you have to put with a marker, the X uh, on the leg that you have to amputate or you have to um, check that the side is right. I mean, uh, some things that don't go through biometrics and some security yep. systems are already there, but things like this happen on the wrong side or maybe also on the wrong patient. So uh, th there are some systems that uh, allow us to put patients in security, but uh, things can happen. So. Okay, so maybe um, not. Th this is Peter. I, I wonder. Yes, I, Peter. I agree with what with what Sabina has said, but we need to go back a few steps. Um, the response, the legal responsibility to ensure that the patient is the patient, sits primarily with the doctor. The medical legal responsibility is that the doctor knows who the patient is, and that if you're going to give some medical treatment, that you're giving it to the correct patient. We all know that. Uh, you asked your name and your date of birth and all that kind of information many, many times. So the primary method of identifying who a patient is, is to ask the patient if it's possible, you know, and or to ask someone if the patient is unconscious. But most of the time, uh, the patient is conscious and you can ask them who what their name is and you can, you know, you have their documentation. There's usually not much doubt, but the legal responsibility sits on the doctor. So any kind of biometrics that we have will for many years be supplementary to the legal responsibility of finding out who your patient is. And uh, so although it's equal, you know, the patient has, a, has the right to know the legal responsibility and the consequences of having the wrong patient sits with the doctor and or the health care provider or the hospital. And the other thing that I should take into account is that when people go to work in a hospital on a given day, um, they're already checked in. You know whether they're in the hospital or not because they, they log in using their existing system. Um, so if, there's, if it's going to be possible, and they won't be coming into the hospital with a mask and gloves on. So the first check, the uh, reason I didn't vote for use case one and use for use case three is because it should be done on a limited, might only be necessary on a limited basis. But the obvious place to check whether a patient, so that the first check is, well, that person 
didn't come to work today and whoever is claiming to be them is there. And also I don't see circumstances in which someone couldn't stand in front of a camera and move their mask to allow them to be recognized. Um, and then, you know, put it back on again or push it back up again. And um, the third question I had, and I asked, and I don't, wasn't not satisfied with the answer is that in our system, there are areas where we simply do not allow a smartphone or equivalent device be brought into the hospital or part of the hospital. We don't allow personal phones in. If we require our staff and we have large, large numbers of staff and they're members of a union, if we require them to use a, a smartphone, well, then we have to give them a smartphone. That's fine if you have 100 employees, but we have 100,000 employees. And to give them all a smartphone uh, would be likely to be very expensive and difficult and using it and having it. And do you have your personal phone or do you have your work phone and all of those things? So I'm still very conscious of the huge advantage of being able to have um, a full face recognition like you have with, with a passport or something like that. And that you, you put the defenses further back so that if you go to, if you, you know, to get into a, a scanning, a room in which there's a CT scanner, it might be better to put that defense on the outside and you, you, you go in further in, not to be expecting people to do it. Uh, we, we might be trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Uh, uh, if, I, if I may answer to that, this is very interesting. And I think uh, we need to distinguish uh, two things. First of all, what we are discussing, it's uh, some technological advances uh, using a different way than the physical way we have today to identify someone. We never, we never, uh, we want to investigate actually where they should reside, as you said, and uh, how it should be implemented again, as you said. So in that respect, I totally agree with you that uh, we can find ways to identify the workers that are coming inside the hospital. And we can find ways to use biometrics without the use of a smartphone. The reason we need the smartphone mainly is to employ two factors of authentication, like you do with your bank. With your bank, you put your credentials on the website, and then the bank, in order to identify that it is actually you, sends you an SMS on the phone uh, or prompt something on an app, on a secure app on the phone in order to allow you to go through. Uh, this could be uh, a two-step authentication mechanism, part of the, the workflow of the hospital accepting workers. So yes, I totally agree with you. But for example, think that uh, on the other side, if you, if you think in a different use case, imagine uh, the doctor wanting to access uh, some medical records while inside the hospital. The way to to log in would be very easy with his uh, his iris, right? A system using his iris to identify the doctor and allow him access uh, to this uh, to this record instead of asking someone to do it. I mean, there are many use cases you can work around, but for sure, smartphones is not a prerequisite for biometrics. And I agree with you; it would be a major drawback yeah. in that respect. Uh May, may, may I shortly uh, remind why we selected a smartphone that could be a hardware token that is not a smartphone, but the reason why we wanted also that is legal. If you do some biometrics, you need a, a reference template. So either you store it in a centralized database, and because the devices are shared, it cannot be linked to one device it has to be centralized, or you store it in a token that um, the, the, the doctor has. So the, the, the reason why we selected that, and it was a smartphone because it was more convenient for the purpose of this demonstration, was that it makes it possible to um, make an implementation where all the people will carry their own biometrics and it will never be shared because I, uh, otherwise it will never be accepted for deployment because it's not proportional. Uh, so the, I, I understand that personal device may be a threat for security and that hardware token has, have a cost, but today most hospitals have a badge. And I think that of course, it, re it, it, it requires some developments that are beyond the scope of Panacea, but I think that the hardware tokens could be quite cheap. 
uh, they need some memory, they need some computing power, but I don't think they need a lot. I mean, match on card with only a SIM card is something that works today. Uh, so I'm, I'm not cons well, I don't think you need to take into account the cost of a smartphone, but to take more into account the fact that if you don't have this hardware token, then you have a centralized database and you will never have the uh, acceptation of something like the CNIL. At least for friends, I'm very convinced. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for these, this really interesting discussion. Um, we're running out of time, so I would suggest we move on to use cases eight and nine. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to be fast for me, but once again, I want you to, um, uh, to, um, to elaborate on that, Manolis. For, for me, in terms of identity management, use case eight and nine, are very similar because it's about have, having a digital identity for patients based on biometrics. And because the digital identity is based on biometrics, you can control the, 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 the patient connection to, to um, his um, appointment or whatever, but you can also link uh, the health records, etc., and you can also, when the patient is in front of you and you don't know him or her, be sure that it's the same patient that uh, the record uh, you have been, um, that has been brought to your attention. So it's mostly about uh, a very large digital um, identity based on biometric for patients. Uh, so uh, for me, there are, really a number of benefits that are, um, that are here, which is really uh, to, to make all operation remote very well, far, far more easier and personal, uh, to check um, the, the medical records and associate it then for new, for new patient, make sure that they are exactly uh, the patient that are associated with the health records, etc. Uh, but there are drawbacks, which is patient may not be eligible to biometrics. Uh, and I fear personally um, that this will be one of the things that will be massively uh, not accepted by the population. But um, that's only my opinion. So I don't know if you have. Uh, comments. I hope you have comments. Please. I tend to agree with uh, with Claude, uh, but at the same time, uh, these two. This is the future. I mean, these two new new use cases that Manolis has added are obviously where we're going towards. Uh, now, th this uh, European uh, identity vaccination or whatever, a passport, or, I think it is something that is, uh, is upcoming, at least uh, from what I hear here in Italy. So maybe it will be with a QR code or something else, but some kind of identity maybe biometrics is a little bit too much, but uh, I mean, uh, it's one of the, these two use cases are one of the problems of the, our near future. So some way they have to be addressed. Maybe biometrics is not the, it won't be accepted so much. I tend to agree with you, Claude. Uh, it, it, it's, it's always a problem. However, sometimes it succeeds. We have biometrics in passports. So maybe mm -hmm. we should, Exactly. put some stones in order to move towards um, this kind of deployment, but it's, it's a massive one. It's, it's, um, it's a challenge. So we, we need to address challenges, but it, it's a challenge. Yes, Claude, exactly. You pointed uh, very correctly to this fact. We have biometrics in our passports and uh, in EU, I think many, many people are now very, are feeling very, very, very free, very nice to use these new passports and to be able to, to go through security uh, very quickly using their biometrics uh, modalities. But more than that, I think these specific use cases uh, try to describe how people, how citizens interact with the state. So now 
we need to think of healthcare not as services in between a hospital and a patient or a, a, a doctor and a patient or a health practitioner and other health practitioners. We need to think the relationship of, of citizens with healthcare authorities. So here we would like to acknowledge uh, how the state, how uh, the central administration of a, of, a, of a state is actually trying to make sure that all the citizens that have the right to access uh, services, electronic services, can do it in a very easy way, in a very convenient way. Again, we extrapolated this use case from the example of Greece. And uh, allow me to say that I'm very, actually I'm very proud that th this happened in Greece during the last year. Uh, the respected ministries that uh, undertook this uh, initiative uh, in order to expand the way Greek people have access to services, it's amazing. And uh, we need to acknowledge the fact that many things now can happen through uh, this kind of new, this new electronic services offered to people. So in that respect, we need to make sure that uh, these services are able to identify uh, each specific citizen from uh, 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 someone that is trying to, to do something bad or to take information to go uh, to have access to information that he's not supposed to be. Right now, actually, two-factor authentication is very common. So uh, I know that all the people uh, uh, that are using these services, they need to go through a two-factor authentication. So again, the fact that we don't need to remember something, but we're just using our face or our voice and uh, our phone that we carry with us to access this from everywhere, I think it's a big plus uh, and this is the only thing that had been mentioned as a drawback now to the existing uh, services. The fact that we need to remember our password that we issued for these services, our social security password, IRS password, etc. So this is the reason that these cases exist here to access public health services for us concerning our health status, our vaccination status, where can we get vaccinated, et cetera, et cetera. So in that instance, and with this, I would like to, to conclude the, the priority here, which is immediate, not only affects us as individuals or the healthcare system as a system, but it also protects per se our data, de facto our data, because we don't need to carry our data. We just need to allow to be identified and then the organizations, the backend services will be able to retrieve our data because we're talking about uh, government organization, government services. And I think this is a big plus in this specific case. I, I propose to all these people that uh, haven't seen it to go and have a look at our website Claude, can you go to, to the next use case where we have the links of Envolio, Telia.gr and... Uh... Yes. So this is, I encourage you to go and see, this is an example. This is something very, this is a nice example. You, you are going to have the the, uh, the um, PowerPoint, so you will be able to use these links. Stephanie, because we are yes. already uh, late, I propose yes. that um, we stop there, except if you have new uh, remarks, which would be great. Yeah, I just have a little announcement to make and then we can close. Just bear with me, I'll show you my screen.
screen. So for those of you still online, thank you very much uh, for all your valued feedback today through the polling and through the interactive discussions. I'd like to just announce that our next um, end user and stakeholder workshop will be taking place on the 4th of May from 10 to 12 CST. Um, this workshop will also be interactive and will walk participants through the complete Panacea toolkit, um, which is a really comprehensive set of uh, tools um, to build to um, protect against cyber attacks and to also support uh, the secure behaviour of medical staff or medical and hospital staff. So that's a nice uh, invitation that we'd like to extend to all our participants. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's been a really, I think, valuable workshop. Um, so uh, we, we thank you very much to all you very good people for coming on this um, workshop this morning and giving us your, your feedback and sharing your experiences. And I would wish everyone working in the healthcare sector all the very best in these still very difficult times. Uh, and I think that the pandemic has taught us a lot about the value of the healthcare sector. And I think this should be, this is my personal opinion, we need more funding and we need to keep this, we need to keep this as, it needs to be a super precious national research right across the world. So stay safe and take care. We hope to see you in our upcoming workshop. And thank you to all our panelists and all the hard work that's been done on um, this ongoing standardization work. So um, I think we've got some good use cases now to take forward. Um, if anyone would like to make a final comment, please do so, Claude or Pierre or Manolis. I think that I think we're quite satisfied though with the um, Yes, indeed, Stephanie. Yeah. We're very satisfied. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Th thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you to all of thank our. Thank you. Yeah, all of our participants. Thank you to our all the people also from our health partner IECM and HSC for all their feedback as well, and to every uh, every other participant, to Sabina as well um, from the Gemelli Hospital in um, in Italy. So thanks again, and we'll. Um, We'll, we'll get back to you when the, when the slides are all available and the recording is available online. So do take care and thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.